Hi again. So we need to spend some time talking about behaviorism because it had such a defining role um, in the creation of cognitive psychology. So behaviorism was started by an American, a fellow by the name of John B. Watson, who argued that the only um, thing that psychologists can study scientifically is behaviors that you can observe. Not what goes on inside the brain, which we can't observe, but behaviors, reaching, grabbing, talking, pointing. Um, that's really important because I just told you about a series of studies by Ebbinghaus and by Donder, which were attempts to study what's in the brain, cognition, what you can't see happening. So as behaviorism became more and more popular, especially in the US, um, research that studied mental processes, that studied cognition, fell out of favor and they were pushed to the side. Um, let me give you an example of behaviorism, just as a reminder. Uh, Watson's most famous for his study of a little boy called Little Alpert. Um, behaviorism is the study of stimulus and response. If you want to teach your child to say please, then what you might do if you take a behaviorist approach is every time the child says please, you reward them. Give them an M&M, for example. Um, some people thought that behaviorism could only explain very simple things. Um, but Watson pushed it. He said, mm, I think behaviorism can explain a lot, and I think it can explain phobias, the fears that we have and often don't know where those fears come from, so a fear of heights or a fear of spiders. What Watson did in his famous Little Alpert study was to test the idea of whether he could cause a little boy, Alpert, to become phobic of fuzzy white things. Now normally fuzzy white things like a little fuzzy bear or a bunny rabbit, these are not things that typically cause fear. So Watson said, ah, can I change somebody's response using behaviorism to create a phobia, to create something as complex as a phobia? So what he did is depicted in the uh, static cartoons below that were actually taken from the study. On the first picture, um, on the left, you can see a dr drawing, really, of little Alpert with a little white mouse, or actually a lab rat, uh, running beside him, and little Alpert's not bothered at all. Um, but what, and Watson introduced a number of fuzzy things, a bunny, a teddy bear, and the boy was not afraid of them at all. But then what he did is every time he introduced something that was fuzzy, he made a big, loud, that's not loud, boom, a big scary sound, boom which you can see implied um, in the middle picture at the bottom with that outline of a hammer. So imagine every time little Albert's presented with something fluffy, a big giant bang sound happens. Bang, fluffy, bang, fluffy, bang. The banging sound is scary. So in the last picture on the right, you can see little Albert crying now when a bunny is presented to him. So what Watson um, proved is that you could use classical conditioning to cause phobias, right? In other words, behaviorism can explain a lot. That was his argument. I've uh, put a link in the slide there um, so you can see original footage from this study. Okay. Um, if you've studied behaviorism, John B. Watson probably isn't the first name that comes to your mind. The more famous scientist, a professor from Indiana named B.F. Skinner, probably is what comes to your mind. And, and Skinner um, really took the lead um, as a scientist in pushing behaviorism in the U.S. And what he argued, again, is that psychology could only involve the study of things that you can see, observable behaviors. Um, and he argued that all of human behavior was defined by the relationship between um, uh, stimulus and reinforcement. And briefly, 
if I give you a reward for doing something, you'll do it again later. If I punish you for doing something, then you're less likely to do that thing later. Um, Skinner went so far as to argue that this thing that you think you have, free will, like when you wake up in the morning, do you decide time to get up or oh, snooze button, five more minutes of sleep, please. That sense of free will. He said it's an illusion that everything is shaped by reinforcement, by behaviorism that we're no more than, a, you know, those um, um, plastic bags that sometimes blow in the wind and get caught in a tree, that we're no different from that plastic bag. It's the environment, it's the outside world that determines everything about us. So uh, Skinner has a famous quote, give me a child and I'll shape him into anything. So that's behaviorism. Um, People who study behaviorism have defined the human brain as sort of a black box. Um, it's something you can't see into, so that all you can study is the stimulus and the response, but not what happens between the two. Noam Chomsky, who is a psycholinguist, um, <laughs> basically argued a lot with B.F. Skinner and said that B.F. Skinner was just completely wrong. Um, Chomsky, Noam Chomsky, argued, uh, he really focused on language, he was a linguist. So Skinner, behaviorism argued that you would learn to say the sentence, um, hello, it's a, pl a pleasure to meet you, only if someone reinforced you to say that sentence, right? So new sentences had to be uh, reinforced. Chomsky said that's just not how language works at all. Um, children um, experience an explosion of language. There's a point where they can learn two or three thousand new words um, a year. We can't do that as older people, um, but kids can. Um, and that Chomsky argued that language is something that we develop without reinforcement, right? Nobody has to give you an M&M to um, learn to speak a particular sentence. Um, and he has actually shown in a series of phenomenal studies, um, uh, he and his students, as, uh, known as a Nicaraguan sign language process, a sign language study, um, uh, that language is amazing. Even if you are raised in a situation where you have very little language around you, you still develop language. So in the, the study in Nicaragua, what they did is during the Civil War in Nicaragua, it was not safe to send your kids to school. Okay. Uh, however, um, if you are born a hearing child to hearing parents, you get language at home, right? You talk to your parents, you talk to your other siblings. But most deaf children are born to hearing parents. They're born into hearing families. So that means um, most deaf um, children in Nicaragua had to figure out a way to develop their own language. And that's exactly what they did. So in sum, what I want to tell you is the assumptions of cognitive psychology. And they are A, mental processes exist and B, they can be studied scientifically. We're not limited to the study of stimulus and response. We can actually study what happens in the brain. And C, you and all humans actively process information all the time. So cognitive psychology, as you can see from this tension that we'll talk about more between uh, Skinner and Chomsky, cognitive psychology was birthed from sort of a reaction against behaviorism. Now, behaviorism is still super useful um, in a number of fields, um, but it has a hard time explaining the things that we're going to talk about in this class.